So good morning again. Very good to see you all. And today is the most exciting day. You must be waiting for this day because we are going to handle a history of like more than 2,700 years old history. You're going to handle in your hands. So that's a very exciting moment. And yesterday lecture was really like I. It, I just want to share one thing because I studied numismatics and ancient Indian history and I studied ancient Indian history in, in coins but medieval coin I was I was not very uh, conversant with and yesterday I really I realized that there's so much to study in medieval coins and it's like real action <laughs> action packed drama with so many things so I really, so I was really inclined to study medieval coins after yesterday's lecture. It was very exciting, and I think as so as you must be, uh, you must have felt like that only. So, uh, uh, Divya, before I just invite Dr. Pandare, I will just introduce my team, um, Divya. So Divya, she is the person behind everything. <laughs> She has done like from the day one to the distributing of certificate, everything like, and uh, Swaraj, uh, so he is, so he's been handling coins, taking out coins, writing numbers, he's very <coughs> precisely doing this job, so I'm not worried, so he's looking after the collection. And we also have a team of young members, Divya's Ganas, <laughs> we call them. <laughs> so, so Chitra is there, Yash is there, uh, Shatita, she is there, so uh, Arya, so they all will be helping you uh, to circulate the coins and uh, any, any, any problem you have you can, you can go back to them. So thank you very much and I will invite Dr. Bhandare for the workshop. Thank you, um, thank you Vandana ji and um, thanks to all the team, I mean it has been wonderful, they have um, pulled it off very well in terms of, you know, uh, how the whole thing is being arranged. So, um, and very efficiently and very diligently as well. So, um, all my thanks and congratulations to, you know, this is something that we, we, have, we haven't done before. So, this is, you know, I, and, and, and I hope that, you know, in the coming years, uh, we, we would do more of uh, such, uh, such events. So, um, what we are going to do, in a nutshell, is that, we have 22 coins and they span 2,000 years and I'm going to sort of s spread them, start circulating them from this end. They would go around uh, this way and then they will come here and they will come here and Swararaj will pick them up. Uh, make sure that they reach Swararaj and they don't disappear somewhere in between and become, I mean they are rare but I don't want them to become rarer than they are. So. <laughs> Uh, so please, please, uh, uh, please um, respect the object. That is the first thing that one must learn when one is working with objects. Um, as I said yesterday, it is very important that you hold the coin in the right orientation. And if you are not familiar with what the coin shows, or indeed how the motives on the coins are executed, it is quite likely that you would hold it upside down or whichever way. So, to help you with that, we are going to put pictures um, on screen, the big screen, and that is the correct orientation, both for obverse, one side and the other side. There are certain terminologies that people use constantly when people are working with coins, obverse and reverse is one, one thing, but um, there is no real, uh, I mean, technically speaking, when the coin is struck with two dies, the die which is in the anvil is considered to be an obverse and the die which is struck from above is considered a reverse. In many instances we know which was the anvil die and which was the reverse die because as coins are struck these dies suffer damage because it's a invasive method of manufacture. So you know you, you, you put those dies together there is a little bit of a disc of metal in between and you hammer. Sometimes you hammer twice, three times until the impression comes. So it is, it is a method which is quite aggressive. As a result of that, these dies break. And if each time a die breaks, it is replaced because in a mint, the production has to keep on going. Yeah? It is 
quite normal as you can imagine for the die which is above which receives the blow of the hammer to break first and damage more than the die which is in the anvil. So many times you have more reverse dies being used for a particular coin than obverse dies. Yeah? And we talked about technologies and techniques and how these technologies can be rendered into techniques for study in the first lecture. This is one very important technique because whatever is on the die, you have an impression of it on the coin and you can identify the dies <clears throat> by their impressions on the coin. So each coin is struck with two dies. They have a different velocity of survival. Yeah? The top die wears out more fast and is more replaced more fast than the bottom die. So each bottom die links with more than one top dies. And this kind of setup, the identifying of how many dies have been used in production of a particular coin or a coin series will give you uh, an analysis of the implements that were used. And this is quite important because this actually refers, these are the actual devices which were used in the production. So depending on the number of how many obverse and how many reverse dies were used, you can create statistical approximations of how large the coinage was. So, and how, if the coinage is dated, then you can also determine the rate of its production. So, both these things, the volume of the coinage that was produced using these dies and the rate at which it was being produced have important historical implications. So, that is one more method. There are, <laughs> uh, there are very rare examples of dies existing ancient dies. There are dies which exist which were made used to make forgeries but not the official dies because of the very reason that official dies was a secure instrument and it either broke or was destroyed. You know, um, so there are very rare examples. For example, we know that uh, in the Royal Mint in Tower of London where the Royal Mint was situated, they found by complete chance, a box in which there were four or five uh, 13th or 14th centuries dies. But that's a complete accident. They should have been destroyed. Um, by the very reason that they are secure instruments, if, if, some, if, if they go out of the mint, then somebody else would make coins with them, which is not right. So, Sorry? E, well, it's um, I, unfortunately, as I said, I did not have my original presentation. So, in the the anvil itself is engraved, you know, and it breaks as well. I mean, you know, so the 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 the, the time when it breaks, it is replaced. So, the, similarly, the, the 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 hammer die is like a big rod of metal on which there is a facet on which there is an engraving. And the itself is that 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 that, that is true. and it is the same method which is used in mechanical production as well. If you go and see the machines in the in the mint, exactly the same thing happens, but of course in a mechanized manner. So it's it's in principle it is the same process. So just to you know add add another layer of information to how the the methods and uh, how techniques and methods can be developed to understand historical phenomenon. This is another very important method because it actually gives you an insight, a statistical insight into the functioning of an ancient mint. Even, though, even when you don't have any other documents from the mint or whatever, the coins themselves become a kind of a, a device to study how the mint was functioning. So that is, that is a very important thing. <coughs> so, um, Coming back to obverse and reverse, so these pictures that I'm going to show are, you know, um, shown in that that respect. Um, generally, the convention is to show the obverse on the left and the reverse on the right. In many of our coins, however, we really don't know which were the obverse and reverse technically dies, so we go by convention. So, for example, when you're talking about ancient Indian coins the type really is treated as an obverse. So if it, if it has a horse, then you know, we call a horse type coin, then 
horse is treated as an obverse. Similarly, for the Sultanate period coins, uh, the, the side in, on which the name of the Sultan appears is considered as obverse. In terms of Mughal coins, the side, the side on which the mint appears, the name of the mint appears, is generally considered to be a reverse. So there are these kind of conventions, so these are kind of arranged by, by those conventions. And um, when the coins are passed, there are, uh, we have, we have, uh, they've kindly arranged for some magnifying glasses. As I said, one of the major uh, main uh, considerations when you're looking at the coin is micro observation. So there are certain things which are to be observed in, 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 in detail because the objects are quite small anyway. So um, we start, uh, where, are, where, where are we starting? So have a look, this is the first coin that we are having and as you will see, obviously the, the picture doesn't do. What is going to happen is that, look, uh, in a way, when the coin start, will start circulating from there and by the, when, when it reaches sort of the end of that table, second will pass. So it will come straight, straight away. By the time it comes to you, N, we might have moved on. So do pay attention to this, whether you have the coin in your hand or not. If you want to make any notes or whatever, please do. When you get the coin in your hand, you can observe and then give it to the next person. So, um, so this is the, the first coin that is being passed is uh, probably one of the earliest uh, um, of Indian coins. And um, it's, uh, as you will see, it, doesn't, it, does, it is not seen in the picture, but if you will see that it actually has a bent shape. And uh, that is why it is, and it's, it's like a bar. So colloquially, it is called a bent bar. And these coins were circulating in northwestern parts of India. They are actually struck to the standard of the Achaemenians in, the, in Iran. So they are the weight of two Achaemenian Sigloi. Sigloi is the name of the denomination. Siglos is roughly 450 BC. So roughly, again, it's not, you know. So, and as you, as you will see on this, there are, um, oops. Okay, thank you. Um, as you will see, so the, this is an example of what I was calling as punch mark coin. And there are, two punches on, on the coin and each of them are struck at the far end of the bar and in, in the center there are some little punches as well as, as you can see. The meaning and context of these symbols are is completely unknown. We don't know what they mean. We know that there are some very varieties. So for example, as you can see that there are, there's a circle in the center, there are these kind of rays coming out and then there are circles attached to the, the, the rays as well. And um, the number of these circles and rays kind of vary. So there is a bit of a variation on the theme. But we don't know what exactly that meant. In the center, there are these tiny little symbols. And the general wisdom is to believe that these symbols were put by shroffs. When the coins were circulating, when it was, it, they needed to be attested by someone, they looked at the coin, they examined the coins, and they put a little mark on them, saying that it has been examined. So these are the main punches which were applied in the mint and in the center there is there are small punches which we regard as ancillary punches or secondary punches which were put on them by possibly by shroff that's that's the understanding no it it does not reduce the value because it does not actually affect the metal but too much of circulation will reduce the value because it will it will mean that the coin is worn and it is lost metal so not in this period but in 18th and 19th and 17th century you have a lot of um, what is one This has been uh, uh, not been made, not been bent accidentally. 
a nearly all of these coins have this shape. So it is definitely made uh, in with you know an intention. Um, it's a kind of a combination of uh, a manufacturing process. We know so little about these coins. Um, the possibility is that because they are, of course, they, there is no second die. You know, they, they are stuck only with one die. You know, on one side only. So there is one, two. Yeah, there is nothing on the other side. The other side is, as you see, is blank. Yeah, it has got these little uh, indentations and things like that, which are probably uh, uh, leftovers of the how the bar, how the bar itself was fashioned. But um, it is possible that this kind of bent shape was achieved because the anvil on which it was being struck was soft, as in it was made up of wood or something like that. So it's because the, the, it, it sort of makes the, you know, strike on one end of the bar and softness underneath makes it bend under the, under the pressure of the hammer. So these are, you know, these coins have traditionally been suggested to date before the period of the Buddha and probably the oldest of the Indian coins in, in this way. So, um, these, there is no intrinsic method to date them. These have been dated to that period on the basis of relative dating. And uh, they have been found in certain contexts, in, in, in certain hordes, in certain associative uh, context. So because of that association, we can do some sort of relative dating. But we know that they were definitely uh, a Gandharan currency. And the normal general wisdom that you will see find in any numismatic book is to attribute all these pre-Buddha coins to the 16 Mahajanapadas. And this was a, a kind of attribution that was proposed by P. L. Gupta uh, in 1960s and it has sort of carried on. I personally don't like it uh, because, <laughs> because uh, if you actually see the variety, I'm going to show you one more uh, as the second one is, that is coming. These so-called pre-Buddha Panchma coins are found in many regions of the subcontinent and in each region there are many many series and about 70 different series exist whereas the Janapadas are only 16 so it, they, they really don't match so I'm not particularly keen it, it is a very simple attributive label that one can find the second thing is that we really don't know where, what were the borders of these, these Janapadas, where do, they, where do they started and where did they end, we don't know anything about that. So, although it is kind of simplistic, nice way to actually see that, they, we call it, this, this, this coin is called as to be a Gandhara Janapada. Um, uh, there is no direct evidence to that. Um, I think that they are function, they are sort of functional units of regional economies and I have reasons to believe that a lot of these regional economies were uh, functioning on the basis of river trade. So I see them series uh, as series which are focused on particular river economies. And that gives, gives a very slightly different uh, understanding of it. But you know, forget about that. You can, you can take them to be Janapada coins. <laughs> so, so, um, sorry. This so called pre Buddhist Janapada coin. But this comes from Maharashtra. Like the first one was from uh, from Gandhara. This this comes from Maharashtra, and um, it has been again arbitrarily assigned to Vidarbha Janapada. Um, and you can see that the first coin had two punches. This this coin has four punches, and it's a very stylized. I mean, you know, you 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 have to turn the coin around to actually align each punch in the right way. What it is, so you can see that there are four punches on this coin. There is an elephant here, there is a tree, there are three elephants uh, going ar around in a circle, uh, catching each other's tails, and uh, there is this symbol, which is two bulls, which are ploughed, uh, yoked to a plough. Yeah? And you can see, immediately see that these symbols are highly stylized, you know, they, they have no bearings with reality as such. So when in the first lecture we were talking about stylization, this is a this is a classic example of how symbols are stylized. Oops. Yeah. 
and uh, you can see that this is a tree in a kind of a box. Um, there are around six, seven, eight hundred symbols of this sort and we don't know the meaning of absolutely any one of them. There is definitely a system here in which they are applied. There is definitely a, a kind of a complex system, I would say, not just a simple system. And uh, we also have no idea or hardly any idea about why, what these coins were used for. Yeah? Um, there are examples in other cultures where coined and uncoined money in terms of metal is used simultaneously. And it is quite possible that these coins were not used for general, you know, buying bread or whatever, but they were used for specific purposes like paying the agricultural tax every once a year or maybe, you know, to pay the troops for a particular purpose. And then the rest of the economy was going on in terms of barter, in terms of, you know. So you got to, make, you got to remember that these things do not happen in a sort of watertight way. So, you know, when the coins come, everything else stops. It's, it's not like that. Other, other forms of exchange also continue in an economy. So, it is, it is quite likely that these, 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 were, these were actually struck um, not uh, for general circulation as such, but for, for something, some specific uh, uh, instances. So, uh, again, it is still, we are still in the realm of uh, punch marks, so four punches, nothing on the reverse. And um, the main difference that uh, uh, one sees when the sort of pre-Buddha and post-Buddha coinage is that after the period of Buddha, we have the period in which the empire of Magadha becomes superior. And there is one really interesting change that happens on, on coins. They are all struck to a particular weight standard, which is called a Karshapana and it is three and a half grams and all these coins they have one two three or four punches all the coins that were struck by the Magadha empire have five punches so and this is again roughly 400 350 bc so we we i mean all all these dates are very arbitrary we have no no clear evidence of, of these dates. As I said, uh, there is a hypothesis where these coins are arranged in a series and that series is mapped on the known historical chronology and therefore we can say that this is at the moment that these are 450 BC or 400 BC or 350 BC or whatever because they are mapped on, onto, the, on, onto the known historic chronology. As I said, the known historic chronology is itself very suspect. So, if you start playing with those dates, then the, the dates of these coins also will... Uh... Yeah, you go on. Please ask, shoot, shoot questions, that's fine. Possibly. <laughs> they might connect to the value, they might connect to the authority, they might connect to... More importantly, they, I, I think there is a very good reason that they might, they will, they must connect to actual minting, you know, because there has to be some sort of accounting of uh, how much metal comes in, how much is refined, how much is lost in refining, how much is then manufactured into coins. So there must be some, you know, it's an industrial process. So there must be some reason to account for that and then it must be ex expected in, in, to be reflected in this. Maybe something to do with dating, you know, uh, when was the coin struck. There is a very interesting uh, story in one of the Buddhist uh, uh, texts where uh, uh, a couple, husband and wife, are thinking about what career their uh, son should follow. This is, you know, this is going on for 2000 years. So, uh, and uh, the, they, they, they start about like, you know, of, co of course the father is suggesting ideas to the mother and uh, the mother sort of then shoots the father down by saying, you know, oh well, but this will, this will cause him this trouble. So he said, okay, well, you know, and in, in the whole conversation, there is a mention that, oh, let him be a money changer. And she says, no, 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 uh, I won't let him be, you know, that's not very good for him because he will lose his eyes. So it, it, it will strain his eyes. So definitely there was a, a, an indication there to that, you know, these, these symbols or their application or for meant something for the money changes. You had a question as well? 
Um, am I audible? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so you said that the coins might have been used for very special purposes, like either paying taxes or troops. So how did these um, special purposes, like how did these coins interact with other economic systems like barter? Um, for example, if the troops were being paid through these coins, how would the troops then use these coins to let the sort of... Um, Absolutely goods? no idea. No evidence. <laughs> this is all very, very speculative because the kind, as I said, the abstraction, because they don't say anything, you know. So, to actually understand what they're trying to say, you either need something very concrete, like a Rosetta Stone or something like that, which actually tells you what it is, or you need very, very clear archaeological evidence, or you need uh, textual evidence that actually tells you what, what was going on. None of this is available. You know, we have bits and pieces and tiny bits of information, but it doesn't really work that way. So the third coin, the third coin is gone in. Yeah. So um, I have a question. Yeah. So are the Panchmark coins found in specific regions, do they have a sequential arrangement or are they almost the punches? Do they have sequential arrangement or they are random? They are what? Are they random? Um, they are not ram, they are not ram, uh, rampant as such, like they, they are not, they, there is some sort of system in which, uh, in which the order in which they are applied. Um, in terms of its nature, there are some punches which are characteristic. So for example, on the first coin, what you found was the, the, the circles, they are only found on Gandharan coins, they are not found anywhere else. On the second coin that is going on, the Maharashtra coin, which, is, which you see here, so this, this sort of symbol, the, the, the ox with, oxen with plough, is found in only certain series of this, these coins. Um, this sort of elephant is found on most of these coins, which come from different series, which I sort of focus around different rivers of the Deccan. So there is Godavari series, there is Tapi, there is Wine Ganga, there is Pine Ganga, all these series. They, they all have that elephant, but they have different sort of other symbols. So there are, there is some sort of indication that these are again regionally specific or regionally distributed. So, uh, but it's quite vague and it gets even, even vague, more vague with uh, the kind of punch mark Magadhan coins. This is an example of a Magadhan coin. As I said, all Magadhan coins have five symbols, yeah? So, and two of those symbols are pretty much of the same sort and all Magadhan coins will have the sun and all Magadhan coins will have something here which is labeled as six arm symbol it's because it has six arms so there's a circle in the center and then there are six things around it so it's called a six arm symbol so sun and six arm symbol are definitely present on all magadhan coins and in addition to that there are these other symbols so here that is an elephant here it's a bull which is of course upside down on in the picture you when you have the coin you can turn around and, and see it uh, here is a hill symbol on top of which there is a rabbit. So these are the three other symbols. Um, on the reverse, now you find these little symbols which are again Shroff marks. Uh, these coins are all roughly 3.5 grams in weight, which was the Karshapana weight standard, which was tied to the Rati seed you know, the, the, the seed that you may, uh, the, the goldsmiths were using. All ancient cultures used seeds for weights because seeds ha naturally have a standard weight. So, or some substandard weight. So, uh, uh, these are all uh, struck to the rati standard and there are a certain number of ratis that makes it three and a half grams. They are all three and a half grams and there are coins which have the same kind of uh, uh, structure, they all have five marks, they all have two marks which are common and they all are weighed three and a half, roughly three and a half grams, then they are all of silver. So this is, these are the common sort of grounds. Some are thin and large, some are thick and small. So the idea to actually classify them that was proposed by PL Gupta was to consider that the thin and larger coins were earlier and the thicker and the smaller coins were later. Between these two ends, he created six series of these coins and mapped those six series 
on the historical developments as we know between the rise and the fall of the Magadhan Empire. Uh, this is a good hypothesis. It works at the moment um, because uh, the, the, the chronology of the Magadhan Empire is decided by the date of the Buddha. But as I said in the first lecture, the date of the Buddha itself might move. So when they, that starts moving, everything starts moving here as well. So, so it is a bit, you know, uh, please take it with a small pinch of salt. You know, nothing is concrete, which is good. There are sometimes five, there are sometimes three, there are sometimes six, very rarely ten, but most, mostly three, five and six. Um, people have tried to see some of these symbols in an attributive fashion. So for example, we know that uh, earlier scholars, who, particularly the nationalist scholars uh, who worked in early part of 20th century, identified some of these symbols as some sort of royal symbols. So there is a, there is a symbol of three arch, a hill with three arches, which is surmounted by a crescent. And a very senior Indological scholar called K.P. Jaiswal in 1920s suggested that this is the symbol of the Mauryas. Why? Because it is a hill and it has got a crescent. Crescent is Chandra. So Chandra is Chandragupta. Fine and dandy, but uh, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, there is no, I mean, one can see it that way. Uh, and there is no direct evidence to, to these things. Uh, it is a kind of uh, derivative, interpretative kind of way of looking at things. But uh, all you got to know is that there have been attempts to actually understand these symbols in some sort of royal or dynastic fashion. It is true that there are certain symbols which are dynastic. Yeah? You have coins of the Satavahanas where a, dynast a symbol appears, which is a dynastic symbol, and it is espoused by all Satavahanas. So we know that it is dynastic. Moreover, when somebody else takes over, like we saw in the case of Nahapana, he takes over, he targets the symbol, he removes it and puts his own. So it was definitely some sort of dynastic uh, implication there. With these coins, we don't know. So that is uh, a little glimpse into the earliest of Indian coins. And this is all vague, as you can imagine. They are all mysterious. They, they, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, they are very abstract. And it is, it, you know, that, is, that adds to their own charm. But following this period, we come into the into that period after Alexander the Great or after the Mauryan Empire, roughly. And in that period, the traditional way of manufacturing coins, which was make, making use of small punches, was confronted with the Greek technique of co minting coins, which was essentially using two dies. And suddenly, coins from the second century BC onwards start looking like coins. Yeah? If you actually show any of the punch marks to any person and tell them it's a coin, it, it, it will be quite difficult for him to believe. But when it comes to Greek coins, Indo-Greek coins, it starts looking like coins because it has two sides which are used by two dies. It also has, wonderfully, it also has inscriptions. It actually tells you who these coins were struck by. So, an example of the coin that is passing now through your hand is of the Indo-Greek king Menander, who is a very famous king because he wrote this wonderful, he's mentioned in this wonderful text called The Questions of King Menander or Milinda Panna, which is a, a Buddhist text. These coins, in a nutshell, have played a massive part in reconstructing the history of that period because before these coins were collected and studied systematically, we knew of two Indo-Greek kings. One was Menander, who was known from this text. The other was a chap called Antialkidas, who is mentioned in a pillar inscription, uh, which is in, at Vidisha in, in Madhya Pradesh. So apart from these two, um, maybe another couple were known from Greek sources, but hardly anything was known. After these coins were started, with the early Indologists, as I said in the first lecture, were interested in finding footsteps of Alexander. So they started focusing on these coins. And as a result of that, they ended up collecting massive numbers of these coins. Today we know of 28 kings. 
only through the coins. There is no other evidence for most of them. So there are ways and means that people use methodologies to actually devise an internal chronology for them, who came first, who came last. And there are certain techniques and certain aspects of these coins that people focus on. For example, on coins of Indo-Greeks, there are little symbols like this. Have a look when the coin comes to you. These are kind of combinations of Greek letters. And you can see that it is a kind of two alpha or two A's which are sort of intertwined. And these are called as monograms. Also, invariably the coins show the ruler on the obverse and you can see that it's a proper Greek portrait wearing a Greek helmet, has Greek inscription saying Basilios Soteros Minendru. So, it is the coin of the King Menander who is a savior. Soteros is savior. And the same inscription is rendered in Karoshti on the reverse. Maharajasa Tratarasa Menandrasa. And this figure is uh, the representation of a Greek divinity. So, most Greek coins have this same type. They have the picture of the obverse on the king, particularly if it is silver. Picture of a divinity on the reverse, Greek legend of obverse, Indian legend on reverse, and the Indian, the side of the Indian legend also carries this little symbol, the monogram. And this is the by and large, the general uh, characteristic of, of the Greek coins. Um, within each king's issue, his coins are further classified by the reverse deities. So this is a Menander coin of Athena type. So this is Athena, the goddess Athena, who is hurling a thunderbolt and holding a shield on her hand. She's extending a hand, there's a shield on her hand. And that is a, a kind of a depiction uh, according to uh, Greek iconography. Here onwards, we find coins majorly fitting into this point of having two sides, being struck by two dies, obverse die, reverse die, and many of them have inscriptions. So from here onwards, things start getting better. Um, yeah. Just to get a context in terms of print. Uh, print. Yeah. Like you use monograms and stuff in print as well, right? So during this time, was it any way related or do we not know? I don't understand. Monograms were used in print? So uh, you know how in, it, in stamps, if you stamp documents, you stamp for other things. So were, was there a similarity in the way this monogram I was mean, used? I mean, it's the similarity in terms of its function. So sometimes do... These mono, I mean, we use symbols in a very interesting way. There is a whole set, there is a whole uh, range of anthropological theory about why people use symbols. You know, it's called semiotics. And there is a guy called Charles Pierce who devised a whole theory around, you know, when you see, well, I, I mean, I can't think of any other example. When you go to the toilet, you see these two figures and you know where to go, you know. It doesn't say anything. You know, sometimes they are confusing, but, <laughs> you know, so, but you know where to go. So what is the kind of thought process and how it is articulated? So what, how do people understand symbols? So in this particular manner, there are, that is the similarity, because when you're talking about actually adding some monogram, you are doing something similar, yeah, that you are trying to pass a message, yeah, which might not be understandable to everyone, but whoever is inside the team will know it. And then there are, you know, other kind of symbols which everybody understands, like toilet symbols. Yeah? But these are in, the, it, it, functionally they are, they are in the same league. They are, they, because they are trying to tell you something. What exactly they are trying to tell you is not known. Uh, most likely, again, like with the punch mark symbols, people have tried to identify them. I mean, like people, when, when that particular, sorry, um, that coin had the A's. So there are so many uh, cities that were set up in, uh, in um, uh, Gandhara after Alexander. So, you know, so there was a city called Alexandria. And it was called Alexandria on the Indus. So, so people think that this A stands for Alexandria. But it's a guess. We don't know. What we know for sure is that 
you can create a series of these, these monograms because a lot of kings actually share them. A lot of kings actually share the types as well in the reverse. So there is a kind of series that one sort of can look at and interpret that series historically. You can say that these, this series was struck by a branch of the dynasty or, you know, because they wanted to show their connections to their predecessors, they started using the same types. That's a possibility. But apart from that, we really don't know what exactly they meant. Um, it is quite likely that they ha it had something to do with minting, you know, because as I said, uh, they, are, they are very, very specific symbols. And again, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, many of them are made of uh, Greek letters. But we have also a whole range which are also made with Kharoshti letters. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a, um, both uh, uh, scripts are, are, are used. Um, the next coin is a Kushan copper coin. And we sort of go in, we are now in the first century AD chronologically. Uh, and as you can see that the Kushans were very much a dynasty that promoted the cult of the king. The Kushan kings were royal kings, they were divine kings, they were divine beings. We know that from temples that are being set up to Kushan kings, as there was one in Mathura, there was one in Surk Kotal in, in, in uh, uh, Afghanistan. They were actually treating their kings as gods, much like the Romans did. And after the king had died, they actually erected a, a, a kind of a temple to his. and treated him, uh, the process is called apotheosis, to, to actually regard someone as a god and, uh, and, and, and worship him. So the king on Kushan coins, which you see on the obverse here, is standing king, he's wearing a Central Asian kind of garb, he's wearing a coat and a tunic because they were Central Asian kings coming, coming from relatively colder climates and they had their own fashions. So they were, wore boots, for example. Um, uh, they had long beards and they had typical conical helmets. Uh, the inscription actually identifies him as Kanishka. And it, it says on this coin, you can see one, two, three, four, five characters. And that is actually N, E, Sh, K, I. This P-like character that you see is actually the sound Sh. So SH. So Neshki is seen. And on this side there would be Shaoka. So Shaoka Neshki. King Kanishka. Uh, and a lot of these Kushan coins are important because they also show representations of divinities on the other side. And the divinities that you see on Indo-Greek coins are majorly from the Greek uh, pantheon, as it were. Whereas the divinities that you see on Kushan coins are from Greek, Iranian, Indian, and Buddhist pantheon. The first ever anthropomorphic uh, representation of Buddha appears on the coins of Kanishka. The, the person that you see here is the wind god. And the inscriptions that these coins carry are actually in a, in a language called Bactrian which is a, a Central Asian language, and the script in which the Bactrian language is written is a modified Greek script. Bactrian language is kind of Iranian in its, you know, it has Iranian influences. It is, it is, it is, it, it, it sort of derives from older Iranian languages. The figure that you see on the reverse is the wind god. And you can see that the depiction of the god is quite dynamic. He is kind of running, like the wind blows, and he's carrying a, a long tunic around his hand, which is bellowing. So he's, he's, he's carrying this, this big, big scarf, which is bellowing, and it, it, it has this kind of dynamic portrait of uh, it being windy, really. And that is the wind god. And his name is written here as O-A-D-O, -O, and that is pronounced as Wado, which is can be immediately understood as Sanskrit Vata. So it is a portrait of, it is a picture of the wind god uh, shown with, uh, with, with this kind of dynamic uh, portraiture. Uh, 
So the next one uh, coin, the next coin here is uh, attributed to the, I don't like the word tribe, which is a bit uh, derogatory, but they, that is what has been used. So these were people, the good Sanskrit word for it is Gana. These were Ganas, these were communities of people who had their own kingdom set up, particularly in the foothills of Himalayan region, in Haryana, Punjab, and sort of adjoining Almora, those kind of regions. And one of these uh, so-called tribes was uh, a group of people called the Kunindas. And the Kunindas struck these really remarkable coins. And you can immediately see that although they look very different, their inspiration is the Indo-Greek coins because they are struck in the same currency system and they retain the most important feature of bilingualism. They have an inscription in Brahmi on one side and they have an inscription in Karoshti on the other side. And uh, here, the inscription actually identifies the king who struck these coins. His name is Amogabhuti, but it does not show him. It shows instead, it shows the standing figure of Lakshmi facing a deer. And the, this is a kind of associative contextual dynastic symbol for the Kunindas because this is found in all Kuninda coins, uh, the deer and the Lakshmi. So we talked about identifying symbols, but here we know because these coins are actually inscribed and we know that they are struck by Omoga Bhuti who describes himself as the king of the Kunindas. So it is quite clear that this is, has that kind of dynastic association. So the evidence to that effect is build in the coin itself, unlike the punch mark coins where it is all guesswork. We, we, don't, we don't really know. And on the reverse, you see a whole symbolic setup, a configuration of symbols. There is a hill. The hill has a little uh, tea-like um, pedestal that comes out of it. On top of that pedestal is a symbol here, which is the Buddhist symbol of Tri Ratna. That that symbol represents the three Buddhist jewels, Dharma, Sangha, and Buddha. <laughs> so, so the three Buddhist jewels are Buddha, Sangha, and so Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So that is represented by these, this symbol. In addition to that, there are other symbols around it. Swastika, everybody knows. This little squiggle here is a river. Don't know what, but some rivers, all ri many rivers are sacred. This is a sacred tree in a railing, again associated with Buddhism, but also can be associated with other tree worshipping cults. And this little symbol here actually is a stylized representation of a banner. And I say that because similar symbols are known in much better way, much better executed way on sculpture. So it is, it is something that people held in their hands. Uh, it was a triangular kind of a, it formed a triangular uh, top and the horizontal uh, bar then carried a, a cloth attached to it or a leather piece of leather attached to it. So these were the early forms of banners. Um, interestingly, this banner at the bottom here has the lower half of another symbol which was associated with Vishnu. So if you remove this top triangle and then replicate the same W like thing above, it becomes the symbol of Srivatsa, which is associated with Vaishnavism. So here you see symbols from all sorts of religious uh, bearings coming together. There is tree worship, there is Buddhism, there is Vaishnavism, there is river worship, all in together. In the center there is hill, which is, which is kind of upholding the Buddhist symbol. So maybe Buddhism was kind of prominent and the other things were not so prominent but the other things were also part of the cultural picture very much and they have been shown on this coin. Is this an example of a bi it is by scripted to be correct. Uh, having said that there is a small variation between the languages as well. So what is on the obverse is an what we call as epigraphic hybrid Sanskrit, EHS. Whereas what is on the reverse 
looks like Gandhari Prakrit. So it is there is a slight difference in 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 terms uh, in terms of. Uh, um, So, by and large, the languages would be, I mean, epigraphic hybrid Sanskrit is also some sort of Prakrit. So, they are kind of Prakrit, but slight variation. So, I mean, you know, I'm, it's, it's hair splitting. By, I think it would be better to identify them as bi-scriptural coins rather than bilingual, technically speaking, but uh, because they are two scripts. So, yes, yes, very much so. The, I mean, Indo-Greeks are probably the earliest inscribed coins. I mean, there are some inscribed coins from, from mainland India as well. But unfortunately, we don't have clear dating for those as we, as clear as the, of course, the Indo-Greek coins. The earliest uh, bilingual Indo-Greek coins appear around 185 BC because, uh, and they, there are predominantly Greek and Khoroshti, but some examples are also known Greek and Brahmi. So the Greek and Brahmi coins were struck by this Indo-Greek king called Agathocles, who was around 185 BC, and uh, he, he was followed by Eucratides in about 175 BC, who struck the first bilingual coins with uh, with uh, Greek and Karoshti. So. No, this is again the Vaishnavite symbol. This is another rendition of the Shri Vatsa. So it is between the between the uh, the horns of the. Uh, and the other is this one. This is the, it, this is an altar. Yeah. There are some other symbols as well. So this is an altar here. There is this little symbol here, and uh, you can see that these symbols. There, in some coins, there is a symbol here as well. On this one, is is not there. So these are small symbols which are added. There is also sometimes a symbol added between the two, between just about there. So these symbols are added as some sort of control marks. Uh, again, something to do with minting, much like the monograms. So there is a kind of a complex system of, of, of telling the people who are actually involved in making these coins that something, that, you know, uh, it, production related something is, is to be understood from them. We don't know what exactly, but it's something definitely to do with production of, of the coins. The next example is uh, for the first coin. Uh, it's a coin in a very base metal. We've so far seen coins of silver and copper. The Koshan coin was, was, was bronze, copper, and uh, the other coins were all silver. This is a Satavahana coin, which is made of an alloy. And this is a, an alloy of copper, lead, and tin, which is um, arbitrarily referred to by people with this word called potin. And uh, potin literally means an alloy of copper with lead in its basis, but this has other things as well. And we have uh, analytical evidence that there were certain things added to these coins to make their production faster, in a way. Because Copper is a very difficult metal to work with. Copper requires very high temperatures. You know, when you're talking about high temperatures, you're talking about fuel. When you're talking about fuel, you're talking about cost, much as we do now. You know, it's the same thing. So, more fuel you use, more more expensive is going to be the process. So, to make this process work better in terms of labor, you have you have to they add. Uh, extra things to the metal, to the metallic mix, so that it exchanges the properties. So, for example, adding um, cop, adding lead and tin to copper actually reduces its melting point. So, it is easier to fashion. Sometimes, not in this coin, but on, in other coins, they also add arsenic. Now, when you add arsenic to the copper alloy, it makes the copper more malleable. It is easier to make it flat faster, you know, so it, it becomes easier to fashion. On this coin, you see uh, an elephant here with its trunk raised, and here is the inscription that actually refers to the name of the king, and it is in Brahmi, and it reads Siri Pulu Mavisa. So it is the king of the Satvahana, it, it, it is the coin of a Satvahana king called Siri Pulu Mavi, who ruled roughly between uh, 85 AD and 125 AD. On the reverse, there is this symbol, 
which is kind of four dumbbells, uh, two dumbbells which are sort of cross over each other and one of the dumbbells has a crescent on top. So there, this, this is the half circle here. So one of the dumbbells has been modified with a, with a crescent. And this particular symbol, uh, only with the dumbbells, was again arbitrarily called Ujjain symbol because the earlier coin researchers found this for the first time on coins from Ujjain region. So therefore it was called Ujjain symbol. Uh, yes, might be. <laughs> it is, yes, but you know, um, visual similarity does not mean uh, semiotic similarity, the message similarity as well. There are lots of things which visually look similar, but it could mean something different. So, this symbol actually appears mainly on like you know um, regions or coinages which were situated around the tropic of cancer mainly it sort of goes above and below a little bit but if you see the regional distribution of the coins on which this symbol occurs they are more or less kind of aligned to the tropic of cancer Ujjain itself was uh, located on the tropic of cancer so it is maybe it is something to do with astrological things it is also possible that it was it was something to do with uh, fertility and plenitude and kind of related with Lakshmi in some manner. We don't know. So uh, it it has a name. It's called Ujjain symbol. The Satvahanas appropriate it and slightly modified it, and they use this as a, as their dynastic symbol. So it appears on many Satvahana coins in slightly different forms. Like you know, sometimes the the crescent is not. Uh, a single crescent, it's kind of a double crescent, so that that particular orb actually starts looking like three ratna. You know, um, so there are these kind of variations, um, but they are definitely kind of you know both these the elephant and this particular symbol are found on Satvahana coins for a long time. So both have some sort of dynastic association to them. Uh, the internal chronology is very difficult. The Satvahanas have, uh, um, there are other entities which are either pre-Satvahana or around early Satvahanas which use metronymics. Uh, for example, we know that there is uh, an inscription in Ajanta uh, which mentions a ruler called, well ruler as in it mentions a person called Vasitiputa Katahadi and this is obviously a kind of a metronymic name, the son of Vasishti. These, what, what Swaraj is asking is that there are inscript, the Satvahana kings always have a prefix, most Satvahana kings have a prefix before their name which mentions their mother. So they identify themselves as a son of a mother rather than a son of a father. So this particular feature is called a metronymic because it is named, named after a mother. So there are examples, so we have for example we know inscriptions from UP, so there are inscriptions in uh, Bharhut, there are inscriptions in Paphosa which do have the same uh, system of naming. So it was not exclusive to Satvahanas definitely and it was a kind of uh, you know I mean people, people make lots of presumptions by saying that this was a matrilineal dynasty and this and that. So, you know, pinch of salt, big pinch of salt. So, uh, for example, here we don't have it, we just have Siri Pulumavi, but we know that there were two, two kings named, well, three kings named Pulumavi from inscriptions, and um, two of them were Vasishti Putras, so sons of Vasishtis, and the last one was a Madhari Putra. So, the next one uh, coin is a Western Shatrap coin, and these are nice coins because they help us with lots of details. What? They nice yes, these are nice coins. Yeah, they're, 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 they're not complicated because they have a picture of a king quite clearly. Yeah, they have 
a little dynastic emblem in the center. There is a three arched hill with a crescent, another crescent here and small sun here. That is another sort of dynastic legend. And they have a fairly long Brahmi inscription which is kind of engraved all around and it starts from here in, in, this, in the case of this particular coin and it says Radnyo Mahakshatrapas, no sorry, it starts from this uh, here in case of this coin and it says Radnyo Mahakshatrapas Rudra Siha, sorry. What? It starts from here and says Radnyo Mahakshatra Pasa Rudra Dama Putrasa Radnyo Mahakshatra Pasa Rudra Sinhasa. So it has this whole lot of inscription which says this is the coin issued by the king the Mahakshatra Rudra Sinha who was the son of the king the Mahakshatra Rudra Dama. And as if that was not enough, these coins help us with <laughs> uh, here right behind the, the head of the king. It, there is actually a date and these are the earliest dated coins in the, in the, in, in the Indian system. There are some Indo-Greek coins which are dated in a year which is a regnal year of the king and a month but very very few. These are the coins which actually have a date on them and this date is in the Shaka era. Yeah? And here you see there is a symbol, if you turn the coin on its uh, side where the king should face downwards, then the first symbol is the symbol for 100. The second symbol, which looks like a, a figure of 4 turned on its side, is the figure for 10. And the last figure is the figure for 4. So 100 plus 10 plus 4, 114. That is the date in which this, this coin was produced. And this 114 plus 78, what does that mean? make it? I am so bad in mathematics. Hundred and fourteen plus seventy-eight, seventy-eight, hundred and ninety-two. <gasps> I got it. So, <laughs> so it is. It is published. It is. It is struck in the year hundred and ninety-two A.D. So this is a very clear example of uh, of a dated coin with lots of information. Again, coins have helped us to reconstruct in the history of Western Shatrapas in a major way, uh, because of course these, they have so much information. They have dates. They have their the names of the issues. Um, the next example is of uh, a Gupta coin which was struck in Gujarat. You can see immediately that the representation on one side of the head of the king is very similar to this. Yeah? So it obviously is continuing with this coin type. Yeah? Yes. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it, they, they show, it, show it a kind of a truncation. Yeah, yeah. this one is, uh, and sometimes they also have a little, what looks like a fabric. So it might be the, the hem, the, the top hem of uh, uh, a garment that he was wearing. Um, it is very similar here. This is the picture. And you can immediately see that the reverse layout is also very similar. It has something in the center and a Brahmi inscription that goes all around. So this is basically the, the, the format of the Western Shatrap coins. This is a classic example of what I was talking as yesterday, as uh, day before yesterday, as type succession. You know, the type by and large remains the same. Little changes are made here and there because people are used to uh, use coins of a particular visual uh, standard. In, 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 their, in their currencies. And here, of course, the, the central uh, symbol is um, changed to a peacock. And it's a peacock that is facing us and it has got his uh, tail feathers raised in a fan. Yes, it's a Gupta coin. It's a Skanda Gupta coin, to be, to be, to be, to be specific. And uh, Guptas, uh, as we all know, were great patrons of classical Indian literature, 
and classical languages like Sanskrit. And that is reflected on this coin because the inscription that this coin carries is in proper Sanskrit. The inscriptions on the previous coin was in this kind of hybrid Sanskrit. You know, instead of saying Radnyo Mahakshatra Pasya, it says Radnyo Mahakshatra Pas. So it was slightly inferior. Whereas on this coin, the inscription is in proper Sanskrit and it is actually in a metric form. So it is in a Sanskrit vritta, as in a proper poetic form. We talked about uh, poems on Islamic coins yesterday, but there were po examples of poems in, in Sanskrit as well in, on this. Is in, on this uh, and the inscription on this coin starts very neatly. Everything about Guptas is very neat. So it starts very neatly at 12 o'clock and then sort of carries on in the, in, in the square and it, it reads in metric form Vijita Avanira Avanipati Skandu Divam Jayati Skanda Gupto Yam so Vijita Avanira Avanipati having conquered earth and the lords of the earth this Skanda Gupta Skanda Gupto Ayam or Skanda Gupta conquers this heaven one of the two so Jayati Divam conquers the heavens, Skanda Gupto Yam, Ayam Skanda Gupta. So it, you, can, you can render it, it whichever way. Either it's this Skanda Gupta or this heaven. Um, and this is, this is the inscription on, uh, of course, these, all these inscriptions uh, sort of refer to uh, the, prov the prowess of the, the power of the, of, of the, of the king. So here we have the example of uh, a big major currency in uh, Deccan, Western Maharashtra, uh, Malwa, Gujarat, and all these sort of, you know, more or less most of Western India in, in a way. And uh, a very important and profuse currency, but rather unfortunate because the very ugly coins, nobody collected them. So, and uh, this, these are the so-called Gadhiya Paisas, because, I mean, we are holding it in the right way. Somehow, if you hold it slightly different, it looks like a donkey. And, or at least people understood it to be looking like a donkey, and therefore it was called Gadhiya Paisa. And, uh, but, as I, as I, as I explained in, 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 in my first talk, this is actually the picture of a king. And this is his head, this is the eye, that's the nose, that's the profile. This is his ears. Above, this is all his crown. And below, this is all his, what, is, what has happened to his beard. So, um, highly, highly stylized picture of, of a king. And this is copied from, originally from, the pictures of the Sasanian emperors of Iran. These coins were brought into India by the Huns, as I said, and then they degraded to this in about 400 uh, well, 600 years, they, they, they sort of ended up in this fashion. On the reverse, it's the same thing. This is a very stylized representation of the fire altar. These bars, that is, this is the entire fire altar. These two are the brackets of the altar at the top. Like, you know, Agni Kunda. So that is the Kunda at the top. This whole range of of dots is basically fire coming out of it and on either side there are two attendants but these human figures have been completely rendered as dots and that's the head of one attendant that's his body these two are the hands with which he holds the altar but you know I mean you can imagine this unless you know the prototype this is impossible to understand um, Massive hordes of these coins have been found. Um, they all look the same. They, they, they are uninscribed. They are unattributable. Therefore, uh, they did not attract much attention to, of the collectors. So, they were never collected. And, but the output of this currency is very high. 
we know in some instances some examples of this type of coin are inscribed so we know some coins which have the picture of the ruler on one side but an inscription on the other side instead of this this uh, far altar design and the inscription in those cases we know uh, that is a coin that is uh, issued by the ruler of uh, the Shilahara dynasty of Thana, Thani, uh, called Chittaraja, and his name appears on, on this sort of coin. So we know, and we know that Chitt Chittaraja's uh, uncle was responsible for uh, building the Shiva temple at Ambarnath. Uh, so we know that this is a kind of a 11th century coin, roughly. But apart from that, it has no other indication. Have we given the next one? Yeah. The Islamic one. So, so the next one uh, that is coming your way, and here we are going to go slightly faster, because most of these coins have the same things <laughs> to show. Um, these are an example, some examples of Islamic coins, and they are Sultanate coins. And the first one is a, a silver tanka of Alauddin Khalji, and um, as I said, you can immediately see that these coins are entirely inscriptional. They don't have anything to show, but they have lots to read and lots to lots of lots of messages in 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 this these these uh, these inscriptions. So, on one side, the name of the king is written, and usually, the name of the ruler is written in a format which has three or four components. So, the first word is Al Sultan Ul Azim, the great, the mighty Sultan. All right. Then, what appears is a part of his, his name which is expanded, and this part of his name is called a lakab, as in an, a, 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 a sub name, yeah? an associate name. So, Alauddin Khilji's associate name was Alauddin and that is expanded into this lakab form as Allah al dunya wa al din so he is the exaltation of the religion and the world that becomes shortened as Alauddin next one is called a kunyat and kunyat means it's his paternalistic appellation <laughs> so he describes himself as father of something so he is Alauddin he is the exaltation of the, the, the religion and the world Abu al Muzaffar father of the victorious and then his real name comes which is called Isma in Arabic so this is Ism and his Ism is Muhammad Shah so each Sultan, most of the Sultans have their names written in this kind of fashion. And then again it ends with the title Al Sultan. So, and on the reverse, he identifies in this circle, as I said, each of these, many of these earlier Sultans refer to the Caliph. And here, the title that Alauddin Khilji takes is quite interesting because he calls himself the second Sikandar. Sikandar Al Thani, the second Alexander. So the memory of Alexander is still very much in in vogue. Nearly one and a half thousand years after uh, Alexander, and he calls himself the second Sikandar, but he also calls himself Yamin Ul Khilafat, the right hand of the of the Caliph, and Nasir Amir Al Mu'minin, the helper of the leader of the faithful. So these, these are all the appellations that he suggests to kind of tell people that he is legitimized by the Caliph. Not only that, he also is closely associated with the Caliphate. So, and in the margins you have the inscription which starts from here and reads all the way along mentioning the place where the coin is minted and the the ear in which is minted. The ear is, is written, this is all Arabic. 
the written the the year is written in an arabic form and uh, the date is of course reckoned in the hijra the islamic year the islamic calendar system It's written in words. It's not written in numbers. It's written in words. So it, it reads, I just, I was trying to find out. This is Sana here. You have to turn the coin around. This is, well, it starts from here. So it says Darb, which is, means truck. Hidra, this one. al Fitra, which means piece of silver. Bahadrat Delhi, in the venerable Delhi. Fi in Sana. And then what follows all this here is the is the full Arabic day. Aligned to the harvest seasons, so it has to be used. So hmm. Yes, it can be. It can be. It can be. Not always. The next coin that I'm passing on is a coin of the sultans of Gujarat, and here again the same thing happens. On one side there is all the names and titles of the king. On the reverse there is this lovely little design uh, which says Al Sultan Mahmud Shah. And this is a coin struck by the Gujarat Sultan Mahmud I, who was also called Mahmud Begda, because he was the first Begda. He was also the first king who captured two major fortresses in Gujarat. One was Junagadh, which was in western Gujarat, and one was Champaner, which is in eastern Gujarat. Champaner is near Baroda. So he became the lord of two fortresses, therefore, he was called Begda. And uh, this coin is struck here again, the name of the Mint is written from here, Darb, Shahre Mukarram, Muhammadabad, Urf Champaner. So it, it gives you the full mint name. The mint has an appellation. The, the, it's a capital city, so it is called Shahre Mukarram, uh, the city of the, of the most benevolent uh, or the most blessed, the most blessed city. Uh, Muhammadabad is, of course, the Islamic name given to Champaner. But it also retains the original Indian name sent by Urf Champaner. And here on this coin, the date is written in numbers. And it is 903 turning around. So that is that is that is when the coin was struck. Next is an example of uh, coins from the Deccan, and this is a coin of uh, the Bahmani dynasty. And issued by uh, a king whose name was Shihabuddin Ahmad Shah II and he was a very well-known Bahmani king and almost uh, you know almost uh, elevated to the high, to the level of a saint and he, he he has the appellation Ahmad Shah Wali so he's he has this kind of honorific Wali that comes after his name because he was closely associated with lots of Sufi saints and he was spiritually and metaphysically inclined and, you know, and also venerated in many ways. Um, his name appears in this kind of a oval fashion, oval cartouche here. And it says Shihab al Dunya al Din. And Shihab al Din is sort of expanded. Ahmad Shah al Sultan. <coughs> On the other side, there are lots of titles that are given to him. 
Al Sultan, the great Sultan, the Sultan, Al Adil, Al Badil, Al Nasser, Lidin, uh, Wa Dunya. So he is uh, the just, the the compassionate, and he is also the helper of the, the the religion and helper to the religion and the world. This is the mint name. It says Zarb or Zarb Bahazrat and here it reads Ahasanabad. Ahasanabad was the name given to the Bahamani capital of Gulbarga. Uh, after the first Bahamani uh, um, uh, king whose name was um, Hassan Shah, also called Bahman Shah. So from Hassan Shah, his name was given as Ahasanabad. And here again, the, na the date here appears in numbers, that is 827. The next is an example of uh, what I was talking yesterday about. It's a coin which is called as a Larin. And it is called as a Larin because it was actually struck first in the province of Lar, which is located to the south of Gujarat, uh, sorry, south of, south of Iranian coast. And from that sort of Persian Gulf region, it arrived onto the western coast of India and became very popular as a coin. So this is a Larin coin struck in an Iranian style by the sultans of Bijapur, Adil Shahis, who controlled the western coast at that time. And they also had a, a close religious connection with, uh, with Iran because both are hardcore Shias. The Adil Shahis were also Shias, the Iranian rulers were also Shias. So there was a, a kind of a connection. A very uh, unique uh, kind of shape which is called as a hairpin kind of shape. But uh, again, this is quite interesting that once you start off, why, why would they use this shape? And it is because it is much easier to manufacture. Um, the technique of drawing, pulling wires of particular diameters is a very ancient technique. People know it from Neolithic times. That metals can be pulled into wires of a particular diameter. So, when you have a wire pulled from silver of a particular diameter, to actually weigh it, you can weigh it by length, because diameter is constant. So, you know that if the diameter is so much so, so many inches will weigh so much. So, it is much easier to actually make these coins. You have a wire, you snip the wire into the required lengths, fold them up, strike with dice, off you go. So all the, you know, actually the, you know, to make the, the, there's a lot of technology and a lot of labor involved in making round coins. You know, you got to make a rod, you got to slice the rod into slices and then, you know, of particular weight, you got to check the weight again. This is a much easier and uh, a quicker way to, to, to make coins. Of course, unfortunately, that means that not a lot of inscription is visible. Um, but since it was a faster way of manufacturing coins, you can see immediately that this kind of currency must have serviced an economy which was fast moving because you know they wanted more and more coins produced in, 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 quick, in, in quick ways. The next one is a historic coin because it is a rupee issued under the rule of Sher Shah. And this is the, this is not the first rupee as such, but this is the first time rupees were struck in India and this is an example of an early Suri rupee. Um, these have the profession of faith, uh, the Kalima or the Shahada on one side, the names of the caliphs in, in the, bra in, in, in the, in the bar margins. On the other side, it has the name Sher Shah Al Sultan with an invocation that runs here, which reads Khallada Allah Mulkahu. May his rule be perpetuated by God. This is a, a prayer to the God uh, to, to say, Let Sher Shah rule forever. And 
here it is the date 949 uh, in the margins the full name of shersha appears as faridu dunya wa aldin like uh, expansion of the word fariduddin and uh, again abu al muzaffar the father of the victorious and here it, there is a word that reads jahapana and jahapana of course means refuge of the world uh, jahapana is a farsi word not the rest is the, the, the rest of the legend is in arabic but there was also a city founded near delhi called jahapana by shersha so it is possibly the name of the mint as well and in addition to all the farsi and uh, arabic inscriptions he has a devanagari inscription here as well it reads sri sera sahi is quite clearly readable so just an example of a, of a no no coins actually say anything in terms of denomination it's very rare to find the word written on them they were recognized as rupees or whatever by their actual content and weight next one um next one is a good example of uh, an a mughal rupee because as i said yesterday the mughals carried on with uh, the sher shah's reforms and uh, started issuing their own rupees this is an example of uh, uh, of an akbar coin which says allahu akbar jalla jalalahu i told you how interesting that legend is yesterday it is struck in his 45th year this is 45 in number and 45 ilahi year and ilahi year corresponded with akbar's reign so that means it is the 45th year of his reign up here is the name of the month as i i told you yesterday that akbar also started putting the names of the month on it so this month here is inscribed as tir which is the name of the one of the persian months and here there is the name of the mint written and it reads lahore it was struck it is coin struck in lahore typically the the last uh, letter of the word lahore is not on the coin so it only reads laho uh, but you have to imagine the 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 last one the coin that is following akbar is another great person after after whom the the museum is named and is uh, our own shivaji maharaj and uh, a classic example of a copper coin of of shivaji here is very interestingly you can immediately see that uh, he moves away from the norm all the coins in his realm are inscribed in arabic and farsi he is the only person around his time who actually strikes a coin in devanagari and unlike all the mughal coins or the sultanate coins his coins are pretty much simple they don't have any titles they only call him shri raja and on the other side is the word chatrapati so very simple designs but you know in in a way in a funny way they remind me of uh, the austerity of the earliest islamic coins that i showed you yesterday who you know which which have no designs no no calli no, no calligraphic skills or anything of that sort very simple design very very core but very potent message yes the next one in in that is coming your way is actually looks like a very much like a mughal coin it has farsi inscriptions it is struck in the name of the mughal emperor shah alam the second but in reality it's the coin of the marathas and the fact that shivaji had sort of started his own coins written in devanagari i mean shivaji maharaj could do sort of you know get away with it because his kingdom was not that big frankly it was a, it was much a smaller kingdom but when the marathas expanded across the indian subcontinent 
they came into this, they faced this fact that all the circulatory coins were Farsi, all were struck in the name of the Mughal Emperor. The Mughal Emperor was largely regarded as a, um, uh, the font of all authority and sovereignty. And technically the Marathas, uh, particularly the Peshwas, also did not declare themselves as real independent rulers. They always uh, regarded themselves as rulers on behalf of the Emperor of Delhi, rulers having certain rights of collecting taxes which were given to them by a charter by the, uh, the, the, the King of Delhi, by the Emperor of Delhi and as a result of that they also emerged as the protector of the Emperor of Delhi. So all these facts, all these close associations that the, that the Marathas had with the Emperor at Delhi are actually shown on these coins. And it is in the name of uh, the Mughal Emperor. However, there are these tiny little symbols on the reverse. There is this is flower. There is a little kind of trident-like symbol in, in between here. There is a little symbol there as well. All these little symbols identify this coin to be a Maratha coin. So it's not that they did not leave any trace of their authority. Their authority on this coin was communicated by employment of small symbols. Many of these symbols have religious bearings. So for example, they, ha they are or indeed uh, bearings with Maratha identity and, and history. Some of these coins carry a flag, which is the Jaripatka, which is the, the, the classic Maratha flag. Um, some of these are Trishuls, some of these have um, attributes in the hands of Ganesha. Some of these have cobras and attributes uh, sort of, you know, associated with Shiva. So there are these kind of indications interspersed in what is by and large an Islamic design uh, to suggest that these are issued by, actually by Marathas. And yes, because here very little of the mint name is visible, but as I said yesterday, you know, to, to miss out portions of coin inscriptions is, 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 a, is a necessary evil when, when one talks about these coins. So there are, there are names which are mentioned. This particular coin was struck in the mint, which, is, which was located in a place called Chandwad, which is near Malika in Maharashtra. Um, like many other places, uh, these, all these names had Islamic uh, aliases. So Pune was called Muhiabad and Nasik was called Gulshanabad and similarly Chandwad was called Jafrabad. And the mint name here appears as Jafrabad Urf Chandor. Much like you know the Gujarat Sultan coin that we saw said Muhammadabad Urf Champanir, it the same logic is, is here. It says Jafrabad Urf Chandor. This is uh, another example of how the Mughal design was used by everyone. This is again typically a Mughal coin. You know, if you if you see, you can't you can't see the difference between the last one and this one if you're not familiar with it. This is actually struck in the name of the Emperor Muhammad Shah. Here his name is says Sikha Mubarak Bacha Ghazi Muhammad Shah. These inscriptions are usually read from bottom to top, and it says Sikha Mubarak Bacha Ghazi, the 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 auspicious coin of the, the warrior uh, defender of the religion king, Muhammad Shah. And uh, there is a date here, 1145, that is the date in Hijra. Here on the reverse, it is, there is a formula which runs as Manus Maimanat Sanaha 15 Julius and Zarb followed by the mint name. This means that this coin was struck in the 15th year of the auspicious installment. So obviously it is referring to the 15th year after his coronation. And the mint name actually on this coin is Mumbai. So this coin was, although it is a Mughal type coin, it was struck by the British in Mumbai. And uh, quite interestingly, uh, the British were really not allowed to strike coins in the name of the Mughal Emperor. Because as I said, you know, the, the concept that the king should have his name on the coins was ingrained in the Islamic idea of kingship. 
So, the Mughals were very clear about it. The Mughals said that you are, you know, you got Bombay from the Portuguese, you know. You have it in your own possession. It is not part of our kingdom, right? So why should you have coins in our name? Not logical. But because the rest of the country was using Mughal coins, the British found it very difficult to actually circulate their own coins. So the earliest British coins that were struck in Mumbai were actually bearing legends in English or Latin. But they were very, very different to what the other coinages looked like. And, I mean, damn it, the British were here for trade. You know, the British established themselves in Bombay to conduct trade. They, they, they were making their own coins, but they were so different than what, whatever the coins that were circulating in the other parts of the country that nobody touched them. So how do they, you know, they were desperate. How do they, how do you actually jump this barrier? Ultimately, luck came their way because in 1715, the British established in themselves in Mumbai in 1664. They start their own mint in 1672. In 1715, so many years later, nearly uh, 40 years, 50 years later, they ultimately get the permission from the Mughal Emperor Farooq Seer to allow them to strike coins in the name of the Mughal Emperor. And that is the time when Bombay starts flourishing. Because at that, that time, you, they get a coinage that is acceptable to everyone. Before that, they are doing lots and lots of funny things in terms of actually striking coins that look like Mughal coins. And this is a great example of this is this coin, right? This is a coin that look, I mean, like, you know, if you, if you have it in your hands and you don't know how to read Farsi or Arabic, it generally looks like the Mughal coins, you know, they have the same sort of inscriptions. However, these coins are actually struck in Mumbai in Farsi language but in the name of King William and Mary. And this was one kind of shortcut that the British found to make their coins possible. They were desperate. They, they, could, not, they could not circulate their Latin coins. Uh, you know, uh, people immediately found out that they were British coins. The Shroffs were very smart. They knew that these coins are not acceptable. They started discounting them. So the whole purpose of making trade flourish you know, East India Company, they had their shareholders, they had to be responsible, you know, they had to show dividends back home. This was all causing a big trouble. So, they resorted to this. And, you know, Bombay was an insignificant corner of the Mughal Empire at that time. In the entire country was, at this time, there were major movements going on. You know, uh, the Emperor Aurangzeb was actually stationed in Deccan fighting the Marathas. You know, the they, these things did not actually, you know, they, it, they were not on his radar somehow. But very interestingly, they came on his radar by a very interesting quirk of circumstances. What happened was, there was a ship and the ship was called Ganja Savai. The ship actually belonged to the royal family. Aurangzeb actually owned the ship. And that ship was plying between Yemen and and uh, India on trade routes and it was attacked by a British pirate whose name was Henry Avery and it was it was it was attacked and obviously you know now the problem was that Henry Avery was a freebooter he did not you know he was a pirate on the sea he did not have any anybody he was not under anybody's jurisdiction because the idea that uh, you know even now there are parts of the sea which are not under jurisdiction of any country you know, there are coastal waters, but then beyond the coastal waters, every, everything is free. So, just because he was British, uh, the British, poor British here, when they had no uh, connection with this chap, got caught in the, in, the, in the crossfire, as it were. And the Mughals said, we want compensation. And these guys, poor things, are trying to say, uh, well, hang on a minute, we have nothing to do with that chap. We are just British. That's about the, the same. That's about where it ends. And the Mughals were getting, Mughals were very powerful at that time and they were getting very anxious about this and they were trying to press because it was, it was, an, it was, it was an insult. It was an affront to Aurangzeb's authority that 
a personal ship belonging to the royal household was pirated, you know, attacked by these pirates and was, was you know, taken away. Um, so he sends an emissary to Bombay to talk to the British about this, to discuss this. Interestingly, that emissary happens to be a historian. And his name is Khafi Khan. And he actually mentions that when, uh, I mean, he, obviously he is, he is representing the Mughal emperor and he wants to solve this matter. And he is, of course, has a big upper hand, as it were, in the circumstances. And he writes back saying that these, you know what, these guys are really getting out of their bounds. They are not only, you know, they're, they're, they're fostering piracy, they're taking our uh, ships away. Not only that, they have struck these bloody coins. They are, they look like our coins, but they are actually in the name of their own kings. Ooh. Now that was something which was very, very striking to Aurangzeb. And Aurangzeb then issues an order uh, and asks the company to withdraw these coins. And otherwise he threatens them saying that, I'm not, you know what, I'm not really very far, you know. He was, he was somewhere near Bijapur at that time, so he was not very far. And uh, I could, I could send, send an army and get you out. Yeah? So these coins were all withdrawn and disappeared. Except a little group that was found in a hoard somewhere in Konkan that survived in the museum. And it was P.L. Gupta, when he was the numismatist in this museum, actually found these coins and found a corroboration between Khafi Khan's mention and the actual pieces. <laughs> so this, this, is, this is, what is what is going on in your hands is a major piece of not only Bombay's history but Mughal history and the history of this museum and how previous scholars like you know, notable scholars like uh, Dr. P.L. Gupta have contributed to the subject by actually bringing together. So this is, you know, relish the moment when you see this coin. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a really massive, it's a very massively important coin. Inscription wise, what it says here is, here it says, um, this is the word Sikka, Zad Doran, so it means struck during um, king, English word written in Farsi, king, yeah, William, yeah, and here is A and N, which means and, is an, yeah, an, down here, Queen Mary. So it's, it's Sikha Zadoran, King William, and Queen Mary. Half Farsi, half, uh, half uh, English. Yeah? Much like how people in Bombay speak now. <laughs> so half, half Hindi and half English or half Marathi and half English. So, and on the reverse it says uh, Julus regnal year, the year of accession, Sanaha year, Angres English, Shaheen, rulers, because at this particular point England was ruled by two rulers, William and Mary, the word Shah had to be rendered as Shaheen in plural and this is five. So in the fifth year of the English rulers struck at Zarb, Mumbai. So, so sorry. Or is not related to that? Sorry? You have oh, Okay. They have you have the machine struck one. Yeah? So I, I'm the last two coins are just examples of very fascinating, absolutely fascinating story. These coins actually are known in three years, four, five, and six. So the, 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 the years in which they were struck is 4, 5 and 6, which means they were struck in, first struck in 1693, then 1694 and finally stopped in 1695. So, the, so this whole episode of Ganja Savai, 
the ship being uh, pirated uh, happened in 1695. So that was the last time, last year of year six was the one that that uh, that was the last year to appear on coins. Incidentally, Henry Avery, the pirate who captured uh, the Ganges Savai, is also a very interesting character. And uh, the the story is that he was the inspiration for Jack Sparrow of Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> So the last two coins are pretty modern and uh, examples of machine struck coins. And uh, this is a, uh, a coin of East India Company. Everything is readable. I don't have to tell you anything about it. It has a, an in, a um, uh, crest of the East India Company on one side. And on the reverse, it has this trading sort of symbol of the trade as in tarazu or scales and the word Adal written in Farsi, which means just um, justice. So it's the encapsulation of a fair trade. That is what is happening under, I mean, how we all know how fair the trade was under East India Company. But at least they, 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 they passed this message on that our trade was fair by this. And it's a half anna coin uh, struck in, in East India Company in the mint at Bombay in 1834. The mint at Bombay, which is not very far, was started functioning in 18, they started constructing it in 1825 and they started functioning in 1830. And this was one of the first mechanized mints in, in, in the country, which was using machines which were run on steam to produce coins. And uh, they were um, the machines that were actually made by the company of James Watt. So, they, the, the technology was being imported and uh, they, they, they created these coins, they struck these coins in the mint. And uh, lastly, has it gone? Um, it's an example of a coin of a princely state and this is the coin of uh, the state of Kutch and it is a, the, the, the state of Kutch had its own denominational system. It, did not have rupees and paisas, it had something called koris and dokras. And this is a five kori coin which was slightly heavier than each kori was about six grams in weight, uh, um, traditionally. But after inflation and in, 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 uh, 20th, in 19th century, the kori had come down to weigh about uh, two grams, roughly about two, two and a half grams. So, this, this coin was slightly heavier than the rupee. So this was almost like a Sava Rupiah coin. And uh, it says Kori Panch. It is inscribed in Devanagari on one side and on the other side it is inscribed in Farsi. So this is again like I was talking about yesterday. This is the kind of a hangover or carrying on of the, of the usage and the titillature and, 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 and uh, the inscriptions that you see on Mughal and sort of post-Mughal coins. And here it has the emblems of the Kutch royal family who were the Jadejas, um, the, the trident, the crescent and the katar, the dagger. And uh, these, uh, the, they were Chandravanshi Rajputs, so therefore the, 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 the symbol of the crescent comes here. And the inscription is, actually gives uh, the name of the ruler whose name was Kingarji, the Kingarji the third. But on the reverse, it also has the name of the English, the British queen as Malika Muazzama, the great queen, the exalted queen, the mighty queen, uh, Queen Victoria. And the name of the mint is given as Bhuj Nagar. So it is struck in Bhuj in Kutch and as Bhuj Nagar. Hello. And uh, the, in, the date here in, a, oops, in AD, appears as 1876 and the same year is rendered in the Vikram Samvat era here as 1932. So it's again an example of a bilingual, bi-scriptural, doubly dated coin, each side talking to uh, different uh, areas of influence that are, that are coming along. So we stop here, uh, slightly late. Uh, <laughs> But uh, um, we started a bit late as well. So I hope you enjoyed. Um, thank you. And uh, um, if you have any 
questions, uh, please communicate them to Vandana or Swaraj or whoever or the authorities, and uh, I would I would take them from there. Lovely, uh, you know, for three days it was a great fun. Uh, so coming. In. Pleasure, pleasure. I will be, as we've talked about, I'll be happy to run this again next time, you know, next year or whatever, so, and do it a more of a regular feature.